There is a theory of sociology called symbolic interactionism, which alludes to humans' particular use of shared language to create common symbols and meanings for use in both intra- and interpersonal communication. In short, this concept of symbolic interactionism is a framework for building theory that sees society as the product of everyday interactions of individuals. Individual people interact with one another to create symbolic worlds, and in return, these symbolic worlds shape individual behavior. One of the five main tenets of symbolic interactionism is that humans do not sense their environment directly. Instead, humans define the situations they are in. An environment may actually exist, but it is our definition of it that is important. Definition does not simply randomly happen. Instead, it results from ongoing social interaction and thinking. Another subset of this is the Thomas Theorem, which is another theory of sociology formulated in 1928. It reads, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Or stated another way, the interpretation of a situation causes the action, and the interpretation is not objective. Actions are affected by subjective perceptions of situations. So what's important then in human interaction is the way that people are perceiving the things that are happening to them and around them because it is that perception, whether real or fake, completely made up, that will determine how they in turn respond. But what does this have to do with history? Well, the history of Western civilization is not static in the sense that it exists isolated from the present. Yes, it is particular people or places or dates, but our perception of the history of Western civilization is going to induce us to take actions in the present with which we build or destroy Western civilization in the future. And it can be argued that it's not the objective facts that really matter, but our perception of the facts that is going to create those outcomes into the future. So what outcomes will history inspire us to create into the future? because it seems right now that Western civilization is going through a bit of an identity crisis. There seems to be two divergent groups. One group who views history as backwards, wrong, and mostly silly, stupid people. And another group who is daydreaming about the Roman Empire every day. If you remember a few months back, there was the very popular meme about women asking their husbands or boyfriends or brothers and fathers how often they thought of the Roman Empire. And they were surprised to learn that men were thinking about the Roman Empire every day. So what is causing men to think about the Roman Empire while they're sitting in traffic or laying in bed and can't sleep or zoning out on the couch? There's no real cultural impetus to think about Rome all the time. Gladiator came out over 20 years ago. I think there was maybe a show about Rome on TV. There's the mention here and there and maybe some Greco-Roman architecture, especially more on the east coast of the United States or in Europe. Well, I have my theory and the theory goes something like this. George Orwell is famous for a lot of things. But one quote he should be a little more famous for is, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. History, for most of history, was probably correctly understood as some sort of inspiration for the future. They wanted to record and study history so they could accept the things that they had inherited and build upon them. So I think there's a tendency or a habit in the West up until present times to view the history as a tool to use in creating the future, inspiration, aspiration. And so when you're faced with a troubling time, increasing conflict or confusion, division, there is a tendency to look back into history or to think about history about what happened in the past or 
how did people solve this problem in the past? Or how could we use something that happened in the past to solve this problem in the present? And this sort of correlates with a growing field of study called something like genetic memory, also referred to as blood memory, which I want to be clear, I've started to believe in in spite of the science, even though science is coming around. But this was also something that for most of history, up until just a few hundred years ago, people would have automatically believed that there are, for lack of a better word, memories that are passed down from generation to generation. I was once listening to a talk and the gentleman whose name I forget giving the talk said something about how if you think about your father and your father's father and your father's father's father, you can trace your lineage back some point to where some ancestor of yours was standing on a battlefield and emerged victorious so that you today are the product of champions. You have the blood of champions. So in the case of the Roman on the battlefield, it's not that you remember the battle, but it's that the memory of being a champion is passed down genetically generation after generation. So when a man is thinking of the Roman Empire, it triggers a primal genetic memory. Or perhaps primal genetics are triggering memories and thoughts of the Roman Empire. And so when this genetic memory is triggered, why is it that the thoughts that come up are of the Roman Empire? Why aren't they of another time? But this is where the mutual symbolic world or the joint symbols that we all share start to come into play in transferring this primal ancient memory into thoughts of Rome. Why so far distant? Why Rome? Well, something happened around 450 AD that lasted all the way to 1550 AD. And that was the Dark Ages. Once the Roman Empire collapsed, at least in the West, somebody flipped the switch and things went dark. And then for 1100 years, it was just darkness and people being stupid and silly and backwardness and a regression, a total regression into a lower state of living, a lower state of being. And then in the enlightenment, somebody flipped the switch and the light came on people were elevated into a higher level of living. They were enlightened. They saw the light. They were smarter than the previous people. They were better than the previous people. They were no longer regressing or going backwards. So you can see how the Dark Ages, simply referring to it as the Dark Ages and referring to this as a time where things went backwards and regressed and people were stupid and silly, simply relegates this entire 1100 year period to not where anyone would deny that it happened, but nobody will investigate it seriously or rigorously or consider it because it's dark. It's regressive. It's a step down from the acceptable Roman Empire. But now that we have access to more primary sources than ever, more translations and more experts, in niche fields that have studied things and put together research and more of this information is available, maybe it's time to take a second look at the Dark Ages. What if it wasn't so dark? What if it wasn't so backwards? What if it wasn't regressive or silly and the people weren't actually stupid? I do not think in 2024 that it is any accident that this period of history, the more than thousand years after the collapse of Rome is viewed in this way and simply dismissed offhand as the Dark Ages. Because in my own study of this time period, I have actually discovered quite a bit of heroism, quite a bit of inspiration, quite a few great men accomplishing great feats in spite of spectacular odds against them. And of course, in spite of how it is referred to today, feats of immense and genuine faith. And the last point that I want to make is 
I know it can be easy when listening to stories about great men to think about it and sort of tune out, to think to yourself, well, I'm not a great man. I'm not a Charlemagne. I'm not a Napoleon. I'm not a Julius Caesar. And strictly mathematically speaking, that's probably true. There are very few great men. But the cultural inheritance of Western civilization is not just for great men, and it also was not just built by great men. And I'll give you an example. One of the most famous stories of ancient Rome is Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. And in fact, that's how we talk about it, or that's how we think about it. That's how it's referred to as Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon and Julius Caesar marching upon Rome. What often goes overlooked in this particular story, which is true of pretty much all historical stories, is that it wasn't Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon by himself. If Julius Caesar had just marched across the Rubicon by himself, he would have been arrested or easily killed or whatnot. The only reason why Julius Caesar marching across the Rubicon has weight was because he also had 5,000 of Rome's best soldiers enforcing his will with violence. And so I would like you to remember, as you listen to the stories of the great men, it may not be that you are a Julius Caesar, but every battle was won with thousands or tens of thousands of loyal, excellent soldiers. Buildings are built with thousands of competent tradesmen. The legendary stories of Western civilization may be dominated by so-called great men, but behind them are legions of competent, excellent men, fighting, building, painting, sculpting, adventuring, exploring, innovating. Just because your position may not be at the top of the pyramid doesn't mean you don't have something to inherit and you don't have something to add to the future. So this podcast is a re-examination of the so-called Dark Ages. This is another hearing for our ancestors who have been dismissed as backward or regressive. This is a series of stories, the recollection of which already exists inside you at the cellular level. This is Memory Medieval.